Uh, I will be starting today uh, finishing up what we talked about yesterday, the images of and stuff. And today we'll be more um, on the sort of research side of things. Yesterday was setting up the problem, and today I'll be talking about stuff that I've been thinking about uh, more recently. Um, and um, specifically, the problem that we set up yesterday was the estimation problem of potential outcomes, and as a result, also the uh, causal effect, the conditional average treatment effect, Kate. And uh, we were left with this problem that we have a, a risk um, that um, we couldn't estimate very well. So we, we were left with this third point here of distributional shift and predicting across uh, different distributions. So I'll, I'll remind you what that looked like just briefly. OK, so our <laughs> goal was to learn these hypotheses uh, f, x, t which captured this conditional distribution uh, of the outcome y. And we, we knew that under ignorability, this conditional equal uh, the conditional potential outcome. So we, we uh, sort of assumed away the causal inference part of things and just focused on the uh, estimation part. And uh, so getting to here was most of the work that we did yesterday. Um, but then we realized, OK, if we want to fit functions that have these, uh, that capture these uh, conditionals well, um, what we would do normally in machine learning is to try and minimize some risk. So we, we picked the square loss as our loss function and said that the risk should be something like this for each of the potential outcomes. We argued briefly yesterday that if I get both of these two right, I also get the estimate of the conditional average treatment effect right. And, uh, and so we can focus on just these. So today I will be focusing on just a single one of them. And then you can apply everything I say to the other one. Um, and well, there we go. Um, so <clears throat> what was the problem again? Oh, this, is, <laughs> this wasn't the problem. This was the solution. So somebody asked me just before I started, and I added this slide. This is the, uh, this is the architecture that we ended up with, ignoring the distributional shift problem. So you can think about this as how I would train my network if I had access to both the factual and the counterfactual. Um, and that's, of course, not what we, um, what we did, uh, or what we, we didn't have access to both. So later on in this little part uh, of this lecture, we will see what happens to this architecture as we are more rigorous about uh, the distributional shift problem. Right. <clears throat> So um, as I mentioned yesterday, we have um, a risk that we're interested in, which is defined with respect to a full population P. And we only have samples uh, from uh, part of this population, uh, or a sort of biased uh, sample of this population, representing the control group in this case. So the example that I will give is for estimating y0 uh, using the function f, uh, fx0. And uh, yeah, so there's no guarantee really that these have anything in common other than <laughs> some kind of smoothness assumption. If we see enough samples, if we see a lot of these things, and we have a very rich model, you are kind of guaranteed to get the right thing. And, and I can draw that picture pretty easily, I think. So if, if you assume that the truth is something like this, OK? And you have a biased sample of this thing. Okay, you don't see all of the x-axis, and actually your whole population that you care about, including both treatment and controls, is something like this. So you care about the average risk under this distribution, but you have samples from this thing. Okay, so you draw a couple of samples, uh, and they're most kind of, you know, centered around this thing. You have some outliers. But as long as these two things have um, common support, if I get an infinite number of samples, I will cover this entire space with samples of this function. And not only that, I will add infinite samples of each point in this space. So if you see enough things, it doesn't really matter uh, that these things aren't equal, uh, because in the limit, if I have a rich enough model, I will converge to the expectation anyway, which is kind of counterintuitive. You're, you take an estimate which is biased in some way, and you end up with the right thing anyway. But you can think about like what is the dumbest or perhaps smartest thing to do if you have a lot of samples. It is simply to take a nearest neighbor um, estimate of something like the effect. If you have a, if this is your uh, control outcome, and then your treatment outcome is something like that, and you're interested in what is the difference between these two, then if I find a sample for 
this uh, curve here and another one for that there, I can basically say, well, it's more or less the difference between the, these two things. And as I see more and more and more samples, I can convince myself that actually I will get the true effect because things will be infinitely close too. Um, okay, that's a hand wavy argument, but that can sort of convince you why this is not entirely stupid, but we can be uh, slightly more uh, rigorous than that. Okay. <clears throat> So the story was about counterfactual yesterday. For any point drawn from, uh, say, the control group or the uh, treatment group, we want to know what would be the outcome uh, in the opposite group. And uh, we're considering now the one-sided case, as I mentioned, trying to estimate this potential outcome y0. And I'll use a notation uh, later on, m0 of x, which I'll just take to be the mean outcome. Uh, I should have introduced this yesterday, I think, but I didn't. So here we are. Uh, but you can think about that as the blue line here, and the uh, actual random variable uh, is represented by these samples here. Okay, so I put two distributions on this slide, or two <laughs> drawings of distributions anyway, uh, and I'll use the notation pt with zero of x to denote the conditional. So this is actually p of x given t equals zero, to uh, just for brevity, <coughs> and it will represent the control group with a, of, a distribution of control um, patients. And then you have the treatment group, which is pt uh, equals 1 of x. And what we were aim to do in this part of the lecture is to show how, do the how does the loss of my estimate of this thing uh, relate between these two things. So how is the expected loss under this uh, control distribution related to the loss under the target? And I've called them source and target here because of um, a related concept that I mentioned very briefly yesterday, which is called domain adaptation. So in unsupervised domain adaptation, um, I'll explain what unsupervised means later, the, um, the setup is the following. <clears throat> you observe uh, features x and labels y from some distribution p, and then you observe unlabeled uh, or unsupervised uh, samples from some other distribution q. So you're left with two different groups of samples, and your job is to try and predict y for samples under q. Okay. So going back to this picture here, you can barely see them now, but there are gray points here drawn from this target. So that they represent the treatment group that we had, and we don't know what would have happened to them under the control treatment. Sorry, it's very confusing. We don't know what the treated outcome would have been. Sorry, the control outcome would have been for the treated. So they're, they're not really on the y-axis here. We only know that they're drawn from this orange thing here. Um, um, but we know the labels for, for the points over here. So that's exactly the setup that we have in unsupervised uh, domain adaptation. We can think of this p of x as our factual. The, the, um, the distribution of uh, features and labels under the, the factual assignment of treatment. And this should be p of x, y. Sorry for that. Um, and this would be our counterfactuals, where we have only seen the features but not the labels themselves. Okay, so something that happens typically in unsupervised domain adaptation is that you uh, make this so-called covariate shift assumption, which, which says that the only thing that uh, changes between P and Q is the, uh, the distribution of the features X. So essentially we're saying that the labeling function is constant across these two domains. So domains might be something like Okay, I want to uh, predict what or label what is the object in an image. Okay, so you you take pictures of uh, cats and dogs and all these things, and one domain might be pictures of cats at night, and one might be pictures of cats in the day, and there's some overlap between them, but predominantly you see night pictures in one in one domain. But you think that what what makes the uh, picture have the label cat doesn't really have anything to do whether it's night or day. So that's the covariate shift or something. You say anything, any information that is, um, or sorry, sorry the, um, the function given, given a certain x here, the function will be constant across the two dimensions. Okay. Uh, so in our case, we will think of, this kind of follows from the ignorability condition that we had, saying that the potential outcome, um, uh, the potential outcome under treatment is independent whether, of whether you uh, were treated or not given the uh, treated variable, or oh, sorry, given the features. Is this clear? Okay, any questions on unsupervised domain adaptation? All right, good. 
So what we'll do today, uh, in my part of the lecture, will be to bound the error that uh, we would have under the target distribution. Uh, so I should have said here, this is usually called the target and this is the source, uh, in terms of the uh, source distribution. So uh, the bound idea will be as follows. We want to show that the estimate uh, of the Kate, uh, or the, so the risk of the Kate estimate, is bounded by the risks uh, in terms of the potential outcomes. And I said this yesterday, but I didn't prove it. So we'll do that. Uh, we will show that each of these risks uh, for the potential outcome decompose into a factual component and a counterfactual component. Uh, and the factual, again, being the treatment assignment that we did see. So for example, the risk in predicting the treatment outcome for the people who were treated. Uh, we want to sh then show that uh, the counterfactual part, this part here, uh, can be bounded by observable quantities, specifically the factual loss, uh, and something called an integral probability metric. And this is also uh, measurable uh, or, or computable. And uh, yeah, we'll see what that means later. So we'll end up with a bound looking something like this. Here is the um, error or the risk in predicting the Kate. So Kate was denoted tau, you remember from yesterday. Um, here we have the two different risks, the risk in predicting the treated, uh, control outcome and the risk in predicting the treated outcome. And then here we have something called an integral probability metric, which is a distance measure between two distributions. So here we have the control distribution and here we have the treated. OK, so this is kind of natural. You end up with something that depends on how well you fit the data that you observe and how different the data that you didn't see could be um, to the, the thing that you did see. OK, so let's crack on. We want now to um, relate the k C to the potential outcome losses. That was the first part of this bad idea. So the way we'll do that is simply by decomposing um, this loss, which is the difference between the prediction that we have and the, uh, the truth uh, in terms of N, uh, sorry, in terms of Kate, uh, where F is our uh, prediction for the potential outcome. Uh, so we can simply separate tau hat into Fx1 uh, and Fx0. And we can do the same thing with tau. So tau. Uh, is defined in terms of the expected outcome, so these M's that I introduced before. And we can simply split our loss uh, using the triangle inequality. So here we have a square of these differences, and using uh, by, by introducing a factor 2, we know that we can separate that out into two different, uh, or into some of two terms. So we get the difference between F and the M variable here, and Fx1 and M1x. Okay, so far so good. So, <laughs> Well, these things, the expectations are not actually absurd, right? What we do observe are samples of these things. Um, so we have to account for that somehow. And the easiest way to do that is to assume that uh, the loss, or sorry, the outcome that we observe has some variance that is down somehow. Uh, so that is what we'll do. My clicker, please. Yes. Um, so we will uh, introduce a, a notation here, the loss uh, for a predictor f at a point xt, and we'll let that be the difference between the prediction and what we act the random variable y. So this is not n this is not the mean here, but the actual random variable. <clears throat> so this loss in itself is random. Okay, so far so good. Question sheet. Stop me at any time. All right. Um, so what we can do then is to say um, this difference here can be uh, decomposed into something, I won't go into details very much here, but in, into this loss that is with respect to the random variable that I introduced um, for the two different uh, treatment uh, groups, plus, or sorry, minus some variance. And the reason we get a minus here is because that the thing we care about is actually about the mean and not about the random variable, so we will have a larger loss with respect to the random noise than we will to the expectation. Okay. So now we've done this uh, decomposition where we show that actually we can decompose Kate loss in terms of the potential outcome losses. And I think I had a plus here yesterday. That should have been a minus. Um, but the various terms, in, in case where we have a deterministic outcome, for example, this would go away. OK, so far so good. So how do we proceed? Well, we dive into each of these different terms. Uh, and I'll do only one of them, I think. Uh, OK, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Um, so each of these potential outcomes can now be decomposed uh, by a treatment group. 
So remember that the, the risk that we wanted to have was this expectation of our whole population, p of x. So no, notice here I have marginalized out t. So it's just the p of x, which means our whole population, both the treatment and control group. But we can separate them, again, just using law of total probability. Um, and we could say that so this is the loss for predicting the control outcome in the control group. And we multiply here by the marginal of being in the control group. Um, and then we have the same thing for the treatment group. Now this is clearly a counterfactual quantity uh, in the sense that we want to measure the loss for predicting the control outcome for units drawn from the treatment group. Okay, so that's what we call them the factual and counterfactual losses here. Mm, so just the control risk or uh, the risk under the control uh, control outcome uh, can be decomposed into these two terms. Here I've used u to denote the probability marginally that you're in the treatment group. So if u is half, these will be uh, both half. Uh, so that's your, there are as many control uh, subjects as treated subjects. Mm -hmm. Questions here? Yeah. So, uh, um, should I be reading that type as conditioning or, or intervention? Here? Conditioning. So we, we kind of uh, got rid of intervent uh, interventions just simply by the ignorability assumption. So we know for a fact, that, oh, I can't go back that far. But we know for a fact that uh, the conditional, uh, oh, sorry, the interventional condition on X will be the same as the uh, conditional. Uh, OK, so you have enough independence. Sorry? You have enough independence and intervention and action are the same thing. Independence in what way? Um, like, you know, back or pass, or, or uh, yes, exactly, exactly. So we assumed that we knew the causal graph, that it was um, y uh, p x, and since these are the only confounders, um, it's enough for us to control for that. Now it could be that actually, in reality, there are some unmeasured things that do this. We assume that's not the case. Okay. That's the ignorability. Sorry. 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 Yeah. Okay. So, what do we end up with? We have these two terms now. So the the risk under the factual. This is interesting. This is the risk, um, you know, the expect, expected loss in predicting um, the sorry predicting the control outcome um, for controls. And this, of course, we do have. We have access to this because anyone. In the control group, we can see what was the prediction like and what was the truth like, and we can get an estimate for this thing using standard Monte Carlo sampling. Uh, this thing, though, I am, we're going to have to think a little bit about how to treat. So, um, specifically, uh, we can do something silly. We can add the uh, factual loss back in, and then we subtract it again. Um, so, what we end up with here is the factual loss, and then we subtract the factual loss, this, this component here. So we end up with an integral uh, of the loss and multiplied by the difference in distribution. Okay? Uh, so this one we already know. This is the loss on the, on the, for the control outcome under the control distribution. And uh, here we have this sort of uh, multiplicative expression with the loss. So why would I do that? Well, first of all, the facts that we already know. That's what I wrote, I wrote over there. That we can estimate easily from data. This part here is a sort of unobserved gap that we don't really know anything about. But here comes the crucial realization. We can bound this in various ways. Um, so the first thing we could do is to introduce uh, an absolute value here. Uh, and that's easy enough to do. Uh, and this could be, I mean, this could still be a, large, a very loose bound, to be clear. Uh, this is not going to be super tight in all situations. Uh, then what we can do is that we can say, well, what if this loss is bounded by some function? Or it's bounded by some class of function, rather. And we will call that function, uh, the function family G. So if we believe that the loss lies in this family G, uh, we can easily substitute this L with the supremum over G. Is that clear? So if this thing is no worse than the, the worst thing in G, and that, that holds if L lies in this family. Okay, so we ended up with something else now. We have a supremum over this integral expression where we have an absolute difference between distributions. We separate this part that we already know. So what is this thing then? Well, 
this exactly uh, is the definition of an integral probability metric. And um, these are uh, distance functions on distributions. And specifically, um, they are determined by this uh, choice of g. And if you make a smart choice of g, you get something that you can easily compute uh, and, or estimate from finite data even. So for example, if you choose g to be the family of all L1 Lipschitz functions, you get the Wasserstein distance between these two distributions. If you choose g to be a uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space, you get the maximum mean discrepancy distance between these two things. So those things, if we believe that our loss can somehow be represented by a function in that class, we can use that to bound the dis difference between the counterfactual uh, risk and the factual risk. Okay, so everything we have here now is uh, estimable from uh, the observed data, which is kind of fun because we started with something that wasn't. Okay, so let's see if we can um, wrap this up. Uh, this also trivially holds for domain adaptation, and this is something that people have realized before. Uh, I didn't invent this by any means, but um, so you can set up for any for any uh, distribution Q and P and some function here in the middle, you can bound this quantity like this, if you believe that this loss in, is in the family, as we said before, in the family G. Okay. <clears throat> so bringing it all together, uh, we saw that before that if we had the risk for the cage, we could bound it in terms of the risk and the potential outcomes. Uh, we had to do some fiddling with the marginal probability of treatment, um, but essentially, we ended up with components that were either factual or counterfactual in that they were losses under the distribution that we um, observed or the one that we didn't. Uh, and then these U's kind of cancel out nicely and you end up with this IPM term that is counted uh, twice because you have it both in both directions. So the total loss for the Kate uh, thing, <laughs> sorry, the Kate risk divided by two ended up being this expression here. Um, so that's fun. Um, so this led ultimately to a couple of uh, algorithms that I talk about. I'll talk about very briefly at the end. Um, but we're still thinking about how to sort of turn this into a very nice practical things for things like healthcare because we're we've been dealing dealing with neural nets for the most part, and then it's fun. You can you can minimize this right hand side quality uh, sorry quantity uh, just using backprop, but um, people in healthcare don't like neural nets so much. So yeah, we'll see where we end up with that. So what do we take from that bound? Um, we can say that we can bound an unobservable quantity, the cake risk, uh, using observable ones. Uh, unfortunately, we have some assumptions that are not verifiable. And specifically, we can't say for certain that our loss is in this function g. Now, we could pick a very, very large g, but that would also mean that the supremum is a very larger set, so we get a looser bound. Uh, we can say that the factual error is more representative of the counterfactual ones in, in that this thing is closer to these two uh, if the treatment groups are similar. And that's very intuitive, uh, but it's nice to see that it comes out anyway. Um, so we'll think now about how we can treat this IPM. <clears throat> so the IPM term here is kind of annoying, right? Because we said before, if we get enough samples, these things here um, should be the same. Like I drew this picture over here. If I have even the nearest neighbor classifier, it should be like correct in the limit of infinite samples. So it's kind of weird having this IPM term there because that would measure the distance between distributions. And sure, getting more, giving more samples would make that estimate more accurate, but it wouldn't be zero. <clears throat> so, enter sample re-rating. So this is something that people have done for a long time uh, to deal with distributional shift issues. And um, not only in causal inference, but in things like reinforcement learning as well. Um, and the idea is very simple. The idea is that if you take an expectation of some quantity under distribution Q, uh, it's the same as taking that expectation where you reweight every point by the ratio of the two densities. So you take an expectation under P now, but you multiplied each of the quantities by Q over P. Yep. Yeah. So this whole time, are we, we're assuming that P and Q are at are aptly continuous with respect to each other? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, we assume any time that uh, Q has a positive uh, density, then so, has, then so does P. Yeah. Specifically. Uh, and so this thing here, we could estimate uh, using a sample from P now. 
So I didn't write that out, but xi here are drawn according to p, and not according to q. And then you could just reweight that empirical sample by this ratio. So this has been used for a lot of different things. One is to estimate the average control outcome on the treated population. And that means that you can get the average treatment effect on the treated specifically. If you do that, that's one way you can use it. You can use it to reweight the risk, which is what we will end up doing. But um, you can think about using these uh, ratios as weighting your sample so that two distributions look more similar. So if you have this, these orange and blue things, you can see that the blue things are more to the right and the orange more to the left. But if you weight the points to the right that are orange higher, essentially you take away or you balance out this difference. That's the idea of an important sample. Question two? Yep. What does average control outcome and treatment population mean? Uh, okay, yeah, so, um, sorry about that. Um, essentially, what, we were, what I mentioned there was that like, the average, uh, let's see, what did I say? Control outcome. So the average of y0 conditioned on t equals 1. That would be the average control outcome for the treated. And of course, we observe no samples of this because we observe only this one for the control population. But if you, if you reweight your sample so that you basically divide, you have q over p would be the two conditionals, given t equals 0 and t equals 1 of x. And if you take that ratio into account, you can estimate this using a sample from, uh, from the control group. I won't go totally into it. But. OK, so what happens to our bound if we use something like important sampling? Well, uh, we know that for any two distributions, p and q, the IPM term goes away if you uh, multiply by the, the ratio of the two uh, distributions. And that's simply because if you look at this thing here, you end up with the IPM between p and p. So any good distance between distributions should be zero if you have the same distribution in both places. That might not be true if you have a finite sample, but let's not get into that for now. <clears throat> okay, so if we take <coughs> this particular weighting function, subscript t here to denote which group we're talking about. So this w0 would be the weighting for the samples from the control group. Um, if we take it to be the overall population density over the uh, conditional density, and we just use base rule, we end up with something like this. So we have the marginal probability of treatment here, and the treatment probability, or treatment propensity, um, um, for that unit x in the bottom. <coughs> We can do something nice, and that's something that people do a lot in causal inference research. They weight samples by propensities, or inverse propensities. Let's, so let's define the reweighted risk, where we take the expectation of this loss again, but we multiply it by a weighting function. Then we can get that the risk in uh, predicting Kate is bounded by the reweighted loss uh, for the control group, the reweighted loss for the treatment group. And then this thing just goes away. Because we multiply by something, um, essentially these terms here, <coughs> w0, p, x, and t equals 0. This thing was p of x, sorry. This thing is p of x over p of x, and t equals 0. And the same thing happens for t equals 1. So we get the same distribution p of x in both places. So the IPM term just goes away. Magic. So now we have a new bound where we don't have any IPM at all. Now, wouldn't that be nice? Um, so the only crux is what are these weights exactly? Well, uh, they are not known <laughs> typically. It's the probability of treatment. And if you think about what that means, is essentially, if you're looking at an observational data set, you would have to know what was the probability that a doctor treated the patient uh, the way he did. And that's typically not something that you're given in an observational data set, unfortunately. It might not even be a continuous function, right? It might be a step function that we saw a set from before. Um, moreover, uh, important sampling measures, uh, or sorry, uh, estimates have very large problems with variance. Um, so the way you can realize that if <coughs> As if this p of x here is large, but this thing is very, very small. So essentially, the probability of it being a unit in the control group uh, for a certain x, if that is very small, this thing, whole thing blows up. So you're putting almost all of your um, estimates or your weights on very few samples. And that's why you get high variance problems. 
Okay, I realize I have to speed up a little bit, so I'm going to give Max some time again. Okay. But anyway, we, we, uh, of course, this, this is a nice idea, because you end up with a bound that's much simpler than what we started with. So we will use this. Uh, but I, this was just idea one for how to minimize the imbalance term in our bound. And we had another idea, too, which is representation learning. So what if there is a space in which we can still predict the outcome well, but actually the groups, the treatment groups don't look very dissimilar at all? So think about an example where um, we have two Gaussians, because Gaussians are nice, right? And they're distributed like this. Now, wouldn't it be very nice if the outcome only depended on this thing here? Because in that space, in just X2, the two marginals are the same. So that would be very nice. And the idea of the representational learning framework that we came up with is essentially this. Try and pick out the information that is predicti predictive of the outcome, and prefer to keep things that are distributed evenly across the two um, treatment groups. So this is a little abstract, I realize that. Uh, but essentially we will have two goals of this representation. One is to find patterns in the data that is useful for, for prediction. So we can see that, like, okay, this is some kind of manifold in this space, and it might be easier to predict why uh, if we sort of find this, uh, or disentangle this uh, manifold. And the other one is to try and squeeze these two distributions together. <clears throat> so specifically, uh, what we will consider doing is to learn a representation where we measure imbalance, or the IPM term, with respect to that representation space. <clears throat> And what that, that, what that will let us do is to um, optimize the bound that we saw before in terms of this representation, which is kind of neat, I suppose. Uh, so this is the, some work that we uh, published uh, over the last couple of years. And what you see is that you can rewrite the bound that we had before, but where you introduce a representation function phi of the x that you had. And there are some conditions for phi that I won't get into the details of here. Um, but anyway, what you see is now that you can compare the imbalance or measure the difference between two distributions in this representation space instead. So if you manage to find a predictive representation in which the two groups are very highly balanced, you're uh, minimizing the, the bound that we had from before. Okay, so we have some work in submission where we combine this with reweighting and specifically not using the uh, treatment propensities because we don't know them typically, but where we learn a weighting function to minimize this bound. And I won't have time to get into that uh, today, unfortunately. So if you just consider learning a representation and minimizing this bound, you can add a little thing to the architecture from what we, we had before. So we have this empirical risk minimization black box kind of thing, and then we say, okay, the representation that we learn of treated and controlled populations, they should be uh, similar somehow. And we measure that using something called the energy per probability metric again, specifically what we then the mean discrepancy. And nicely for us, you can actually compute gradients of these things. So you can actually train uh, an, this neural net uh, using standard background uh, in an end-to-end -end fashion, where we minimize the trade-off between the loss and the imbalance term. Questions on the architecture here? Okay. Now, I, <laughs> I made a note here. This is kind of concerning, isn't it? So when I say, say not asymptotically consistent, it means that if I get infinite number of samples and I have this imbalance penalty here, I will not in all cases end up with the right function, which seems stupid, but uh, hey, <laughs> you know, this was our first shot. So um, the reason why that happens is that we, you will always prefer to keep information that is less imbalanced than what you started with, as long as this trade-off has some positive you know, factor in front of this. Um, so you will be biased in the same way that ridge regression is biased, or lasso is biased, in that you, if you don't remove your sort of lambda in front of these regularizers, you will, pre you will prefer simpler models, even if you have infinite samples. Now, of course, we can have a term here that says, care less about this if we see more samples, but we haven't really shown any theoretical results for that. So what can we do? Well, this is the paper that I said I wouldn't talk about, <laughs> but uh, we can learn a weighting function for which we minimize the reweighted distance between uh, distributions instead, and then you combine the representation learning aspect of our, our framework with the reweighting idea from before, or the sample, yeah, important something uh, idea from before. And the cool thing is that we don't actually have to know the, uh, the weights, 
we can learn them uh, jointly. So what we do is that we learn a weighting function based on the representation that, that we're currently using. And uh, you can show that this is consistent uh, if you get enough samples, which is neat. Okay, uh, last thing. Uh, I just want to make a point about um, using these models in practice and evaluating them. And uh, this is not easy because what we try to predict is something that we could never measure. The counterfactual of some event we will never actually see. So how do we evaluate these things? And the easiest way is to say, well, we can, so let's synthesize some data and, and run it on that. And that's kind of you know, a cop up, but um, that's where we are. Uh, the other thing is to, you, if you know the propensities or the probabilities of treatment assignments, if you know them exactly, then you can actually evaluate something like the risk of a policy that you create from these estimates. Or you can estimate the average treatment effect very easily, the truth. Um, so uh, those are two ways you can go about it. But if you don't know either the outcome or the policy, you're screwed. OK, so we have applied our framework to uh, both different settings. I'll just end by showing you a couple of results on the synthetic data. I won't have time to go in exactly what the data is, unfortunately, because I feel I've stolen too much time. But um, it's something called the IHDP data set, which is a synthetic data set where the outcome is synthesized. The, uh, the features on the treatment are real, and they are about uh, children and their mothers and how some um, sorry, home visits and, and some extra schooling help, uh, uh, help sort of development of these children. And uh, I'll just flash some results that we have here. Um, okay, so this is a large table I realized that we compared to a bunch of different things. We have a linear model here, another linear model there. This is a nearest neighbor classifier. This is a big concoction of all kinds of machine learning models. This is a tree um, or a random forest type algorithm, and so are these. And this is the first neural network model that we came up with. Um, and just using a neural net without anything <coughs> fancy actually helped a lot, turns out. So you can see these numbers here, we want all of them to be low, and just using a neural net uh, gave us uh, something to go on. Maybe we're doing something right. <coughs> then what we did was to come up with the architecture that I showed you on the first slide. And we, that was what I said before. We have the error just by picking a, a convenient architecture. So that was fun. <laughs> so we did a bunch of fancy maths for this one, but it turned out not to matter too much. And uh, so what you can do is then take that architecture and add the different uh, types of um, penalties that I was talking about. So we had the first one with just the imbalance term, and then we had the last one with the uh, reweighting as well. And you can sort of see that, okay, we're getting some incremental improvements here, but really the biggest uh, factor was the architecture there which is both nice and not nice at the same time. OK, I think I'll end here with some conclusions uh, and say that what we've talked about for the last two days now has only been estimation problems. But I think there are really interesting estimation problems in causal inference. And if you take this to um, sequential decision making that we will talk about tomorrow, it gets really, really tricky. Uh, if you want to think about reinforcement learning on how to think about that causally, uh, yeah, these questions are even higher. Um, so it seems like we can use deep learning just as is, and it will still help a lot. And I think the reason for that is, if you think about the reweighting problem that I showed you before, and I have like this, but if, say that we have a distribution like that, and we have a function like this, and we observe a lot of samples here, uh, and not so many samples over here, if you think about reweighting so that it looks similar to that, you would put a lot of weight over this guy here. Um, so if you fit a linear regression, that would matter a lot. You would prefer something that looked like that, perhaps, <laughs> if you put a lot of um, weight here, than if you fit with a uniform weighting where you prefer something like that. So for linear regression or something where you have monomous specification, these weighting methods matter a lot, but a neural net can fit both points fine. It doesn't have to choose really where you put its weight. So I think just having a very flexible model can help with the, these tasks, even without the tasks. Um, OK. And I think we can learn a lot from other parts of machine learning, essentially. Domain adaptation was a very, very big inspiration for us in doing this work. And I think we can apply those to all kinds of uh, problems in causality. Uh, I should say that there are tons of problems still uh, <laughs> that we haven't worked out with the theory and the application of our stuff. So I'd love to discuss them with you, but I have to have to turn over the map now. So good luck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks a lot.
So for the remainder of this class and uh, some of the beginning of next class, I'm going to be focusing on cause and effect discovery. But before I dive into that topic, I wanted to briefly discuss this paper, which I found interesting. It's about style transfer. It doesn't have anything directly to do with causality, but I think there's some nice parallels in ideas in this paper and ideas that Frederick just talked about. So um, and it kind of highlights connections between, I guess, pure machine learning work. This is at NIPS this past December. So I'm just going to dive in. So consider a generative process that's generating text, which I'm going to call X. So, it's, uh, so first, you generate latent style. Call that Y. And for example, this could be like plus or minus one for like positive or negative sentiment is an example. Sentiment being like emotion, maybe. And second, we generate some latent content represented by some vector z from some distribution pz. Finally, we get some text out of this from a process that uses both our style y and our content z. And this is observed, of course. So um, in such a generative process, we have y style and z content both causing x. So So I mean, this is pretty similar already. These, these can be interpreted as causal arrows. There's no arrow between y and z per se, but you know the structure is pretty similar to what we've already seen. So, in this setting, let's assume that we have two data sets. So I'm going to call them x1 and x2, and this is just. bunch of single uh, observed data points. And this is generated from P of X1 given Y1, so whatever style Y1 is, and this is just a different style Y2. Oh, sorry. And furthermore, sort of a big assumption, but could be a reasonable assumption. Um, let's assume that X1 and X2 share the same PZ. The distribution on latent content. So, for example, if we have reviews on Yelp restaurants, then each restaurant is like one, one Z, for instance. And then you have a bunch of people that are going to the same restaurant. Some people like it, some people don't. I don't know, frowny face, smiley face. So, that's an example of that. So, the task of style transfer in this setting. You want to style transfer the text x1 with style1 to be the you know, same content but with style2, style y2. So there's three approaches that this uh, paper proposes. So the first one. It's just a variational autoencoder, so I'll walk through it. So the proposed 
So the proposal here is first we're going to encode x1 and y1 into, into a latent context z, which we're going to infer. And then second, we're going to generate x2 using this z that we did and y2, so this z comes over here. So this is a pretty natural approach. So how exactly might this be achieved? Well, in a very small encoder, you have a model that looks something like this. observe x1 and observe x2, then we train an encoder E and a decoder or a generator here in this case G, um, where they're both going to share the same latent space Z according to our assumption. So in a VAE, how you're going to train this is you know, standard ways to re reconstruct x1 and also to reconstruct x2. And how that works is first you have x1, you encode it into some z vector, then you try to decode it into x1, and you the loss function is how well you recovered your original x1. So I'm just going to write out that what that loss function looks like. Just the expectation over your x1 of the probability by your generator of getting your x1 back after encoding your x1 and your y, y1. And then you, you just add the same thing for, for x2. In a VA also, you have a second thing that you do. You have to assert what p of z is going to be, and a common choice might just be the spherical Gaussian. Um, and then you also have an additional loss where you need to assert that z there is what you asserted. So that loss, you just try to minimize the PL distance of your posterior on Z with whatever you asserted Z should be. And then you add the same thing for, for X2. So that's a standard B approach. Um, they suggest another approach called an aligned autoencoder. And here they're trying to relax some of the restrictions. So they want to allow P of Z to be richer, to be, to be anything. So all the precise constraint that they're wanting to enforce is just that the posterior on Z given X1 is distributionally equivalent to the posterior on Z given X2. And the way that they propose to do this is by introducing a discriminator D. Which is going to play the following min max game with the encoder. Discriminator is trying to tell apart the distribution, the encoded version of x2 versus the encoded version of x1. And if the generator is able to win this min-max game, then these two distributions must be equivalent. And that helps enforce this constraint. So that's very nice. Um, again, it's just taking advantage of this assumption here that they share the same PZ. Um, lastly, they propose a third approach. Call this the cross aligned autoencoder. 
And the observation here is that, well, I'll just write it. So this assumption of this constraint, this implies that the style transfer version of x1 should be distributionally equivalent to the original distribution on x2, and also vice versa. So now we, in the second approach, we use the discriminator to enforce this thing. So in the third approach, with their cost line on encoder, they use two discriminators to enforce both of these equalities. They combine this with a standard reconstruction loss, and that's what they do there. So um, I hope you can see some parallels between these ideas and some things in the potential outcomes. So now I'm going to move on to cause and effect discovery. So I have a question. Yeah. For all of these, how do you decide upon how much to weight each of the two separate loss functions? So, for example, in the VAE, you have like the expectation term there plus another one there. It, do you just kind of naively just sum them together, or do you have some lambda term that weights one higher than the other? I mean, what, or does it does the machine learning learn how to weight them, like we talked about earlier? What, so, yeah. What's going on there? So. Usually have like a lambda term, which is a hyperparameter. Um, for I mean, for these like symmetric reconstruction losses, you I think you want them to just be the same weight. But otherwise, for hyperparameters, you can do an additional learning step to try to learn what those might be. So I should add, like for, for, for us, we also have that kind of hyperparameter trading off the imbalance in the loss, and that's not an easy one to pick because you can't really do cross validation to pick that mm -hmm. because essentially you're never going to have a kind of factual right. Um, Get that a good question. Any other questions? Okay. So this is the main meat of what I'll be talking about. This is going to be pretty broad, um, not very deep. It's going to be sort of like a review on a lot of recent work that's been done in, on, this, on this problem. So hopefully afterwards you'll know a lot of different ideas that people have had regarding this task. So cause and effect discovery. So let's assume that we only have two random variables, um, x and y. And our task is to infer the causal graph. But we're going to constrain this task even more. So first, we're going to assume that there's no hidden confounders. Um, but that's not actually enough. We're going to make an even stronger assumption. We're going to assume that the causal graph can only be x causes y or um, y causes x. So pretty strong assumption. Some other causal graphs that might be possible is that they both cause each other, or that they're unrelated, for instance. Um, or that there could be a confounder, but that's kind of captured in this first assumption. So even with this very kind of simple and restricted task, this is still impossible unless we make additional assumptions. Uh, kind of going back and recapping to that picture I drew yesterday. We have empirical data. We have the space of all joint distributions, and we have the space of all causal models. And again, to solve something like causal cause-effect discovery, there's a there's two ill-posed problems in in layers that we have to solve. So <coughs> that's why this is sort of a, a difficult problem. So we're gonna kind of talk about some assumptions that you can make to, to bridge this gap. I guess to, to bridge this gap, you kind of want like really high end, for example. Um, that's like talked about in other classes. I'm not going to focus on it here. So there's three ideas I want to talk about for this section. I have more than three ideas in general to talk about. First is something called additive noise models. <laughs> Second is on Overall complexity. I don't know how to pronounce his name, so if anyone knows how to 
ounce of butter, comb broth. Lastly, an idea regarding conditional generative adversarial networks. So, first, out of noise models. So, here we're going to start with the assumption. So, all of these ideas have some sort of assumption underlying them to try to bridge that second ill post problem. So if x causes y, we're going to assume that we can write the causal relationship this way. So this is the, the, the definition of an additive noise model. Um, first, it assumes independent noise, and of y is the noise with input x. Um, secondly, it assumes that they're related additively. Um, and f of y can be any function. So it's a fairly restrictive kind of class of relationships, but it's also not excessively restrictive. I guess it depends on your, your, your situation. Um, I'm just going to state a very broad identifiability result here. Then we have identifiability, which means x, the question of this inference problem does x cause y or y cause x um, can be solved if so this is like a, a usually condition um, it's not even like a tight condition I'm sorry but if the function f of y is nonlinear or the noise n of y is non Gaussian so if, if this is the case for some like real data that you have, then chances are like decently good um, that you'll be able to use an added noise model to do this task. So for I wanted to give it a, an example. So if we further assume in this example that this function is linear such that y is alpha of x plus n of y, n of y always independent. Then what we really care about is this other relationship going the opposite way. Where here x is causing y. And then on the bottom we have the opposite causal relationship. Um, this relationship holds for some data if and only if n of y and x are Gaussian. So more importantly that this noise, if f the function is linear, then as long as your noise is also not Gaussian, then you're good. And there's a nice picture I can draw to illustrate this. So let's say we're trying to plot x and y. And let's say they have a linear relationship, of course, and they have some sort of uniform noise. And here we're assuming that the, the true causal direction is x causes y. So if we regress um, y on x, we're going to get this you know, true linear relationship. So this is when we regress y on x. And you can see here that the residuals, if you do Residuals, which are x y minus y minus f of x, are independent of f factorially. If we try to do the regression in the opposite direction, then to you know, gotta rotate this, flip it, then you'll see a graph that looks something like this. And if you try to regress it on in this direction, you're gonna get this line.
And you can see here that the residuals are not independent of your input variable y. So because our non-additive noise model, we assume that the noise is always independent to our input, then we can identify this as a true causal direction. And the opposite one can be discarded. Um, How do we test for independence? We're going to get to that. That's a good question. Um, and, yeah. I mean, if you have heteroscedastic errors, then that can never Right. Yeah, that's true. So, like, heteroscedastic noise does not match the assumption of that noise is independent of the input. So, uh, added more noise models are not able to capture that. It's definitely an issue in practice, too. Um, but some other assumptions and some other ideas might be able to capture heteroscedastic noise, which we'll talk about later. So, there's also something called the post nonlinear um, additive noise model. And I'll just show you what it looks like. And I'm just going to wave my hand and say that similar identifiable results like this idea holds also for post nonlinear additive noise models. You just have a function g on the outside. And of course, you have independence between noise and input. So this suggests the following procedure. So I'll, I'll call this the AM algorithm. First you regress um, <coughs> y on x, or conversely you regress x on y. And you can do this regression with a detail net. You can do a GP regression or Gaussian process regression. You can do whatever you want. Second, you find the residuals. check this, whichever direction satisfies this independence criterion more, or you know, statistically significantly, or whatever cutoff you would like, you output that causal direction. So so one way you can test for independence is by the Hilbert-Schmidt independence criterion. I believe this is the state-of-the-art method to do it right now, so it's kind of popular. So the idea here is that it uses something called a kernel mean embedding. What this does is it maps, it's a mapping from distributions into a point in a reproducing kernel over space. And this mapping has some nice properties which this method takes advantage of. So this mapping is one-to-one. -one. If you use something called a characteristic kernel, so an example of this is on in reals. kernel between two points x and x prime. Um, there's a lot of math with RKHSs, so this kernel that you need to identify as A and RKHS. Um, they're nice mathematical objects, but this is this is an example of a characteristic kernel. So actually it's very easy to have a one-to-one -one mapping um, for this kernel mean embedding. So 
how you would do this empirically on a distribution. is you just calculate this object. Um, so assume you have some data x. Which is sample ID from some public distribution, you just form this object using this kernel. So it's the sum of functions. And that's your embedding in, in our KHS. So So due to the h sec is defined as follows. Um, so it's going to take advantage of the mapping mu of the joint. And it's going to subtract, or you know, find the distance between, in Hilbert space, uh, the product. So this, because it's one to one, the mapping, then that implies that h sec is equal to zero if and only if the joint and the product distributions are, are equal. And voila, we have a test for independence. So there's also a nice fun fact. If you calculate the h sick empirically, it converges at a rate 1 over square root of n, where n is the number of samples. So it's not terrible, I guess. Um, right, so that completes the in and algorithm up there. So. There's a really nice real world data set called the uh, Tubingen data set. But I, don't, I don't know how to pronounce this actually. And this consists of data. So I guess this is some sort of shorthand for like x, y pairs. You have n pairs of them. And this tuple is associated with another thing I'm going to call z, where z is either like you know, left ca causal arrow or right causal arrow. And Z just describes the relationship between X and Y. So this is a supervised data set exactly for cause and effect discovery. Um, one example is X is temperature, Y is altitude. What's the causal you know, relationship between those two things? Altitude causes temperature. So to give you some numbers, if you do this AM procedure, you use Gaussian process regression, and you use H stick, uh, you get 59.5% accuracy, weighted accuracy, so baseline is 50% accuracy. Uh, if you do the post nonlinear version, but still a GP regression and H stick. You get something like 66.2 percent accuracy. So, I mean, I really gloss over all the all the theoretical details about identifiability, but another data point to keep in your mind is that these methods do seem to find like do like, perform reasonably well on real world data. They're doing better than chance. So that's it about added noise models. Are there any questions? I have a small comment. Um, the uh, the age stick model that I mentioned before, uh, it's a sort of generalization of the measure that we use for imbalance. So these these are all kernel measures for distributions. In this case, you have a particular one between x, y, or so the, the product of marginals and the joint. And you can write our imbalance term in terms of the age stick too. So that's kind of fun if you want to do that exercise. And that allows you to generalize the method that we have to things like continuous treatments or multiple uh, treatments instead of binary. Okay. The second idea I want to talk about is Komorov Komorov complexity. There's really nothing mathematical to talk about here. It's more philosophical, but I think it's intriguing. So um, I'm going to talk about it anyway. So I'm going to start off again with an assumption. A uh, much looser assumption in this case than additive noise models. So just, let's assume more philosophically that the causal mechanism, which I'm gonna, which you can also equivalently think about as a, a generative program, so like a computer program, which is how, how you kind of want you to think about it. 
So let's, let's you know, imagine you have some observe observations of some natural phenomenon and you write a computer program that can cause it in the same way. Um, so you assume that the causal mechanism on P of C, which is the causal mechanism causing the cause, uh, is independent of the causal mechanism relating the cause to the effect e given C. So the issue here is that there's no such like mathematical notion of independence between programs, per se. Um, statistically, we only can talk about independence between random variables. But this seems like a philosophically reasonable assumption. So one thing you can consider here if you want to run with this is you can try, let's try to define something called K of S. It's going to be the shortest program, like in a computer program sort of sense, like we have a universal Turing machine um, with some language that's going to write out your program S. So the thing to imagine here is you write a generic program to explain these two causal mechanisms. Um, that's S. Then you try to compress it into a K of S. Um, you know, the issue here is that this is like uncomputable. It's like known to not be. There's no algorithm. It's proven that there's no algorithm that can, can solve this. So of course, it's not very practical. Um, but if you imagine if we could compute it, then if you want to express this idea, then you would be able to write something like the compression of both programs together should be related in this way to the compression of when you're going in the correct causal direction. Um, in contrast, And you want to describe in a computer program how if your causes are arising from your effects. And your shortest compression of this program is not going to be as short as doing it in the correct causal direction. Um, so that's kind of one idea to play about. That's all I wanted to say about that topic. Yeah. Do you have an example in mind? Or do you know of an example of just to show some intuition on this? Uh, an example. Um, I mean, beyond like computer programs that are you know, right to generate mm -hmm. uh, natural phenomena, I'm, I'm not sure, but you can give us some thought. Yeah. So this sort of assumption plays into the next, the last idea. Let's we'll talk about for this section: conditional GANs. So. There's paper for this. Lopez Paz in the book club, it's still like 2017. So, <coughs> again, let's start with some, some assumptions. Assume that if x is causing y, that they relate from this manner. So it's like an added noise model, but it's more flexible. Then maybe intuitively, we might imagine that if the mechanism that maps cause onto effects is somehow simpler than the mechanism going in the opposite direction, then Again, can learn P of E given C easier. And this is, again, very hand wavy intuition. But in this paper, what they did, this is the approach that's suggested by these ideas. You, so you try both causal directions again. X causes Y, 
and y causes x. For each case, you learn a generative model. And in each case, you have some sort of adversary, which is going to try to distinguish generated samples from real samples. So this just follows the, the GAN setup that I wrote up before. If you want a full loss function, I'm not going to write, rewrite it. So when you're trying x causes y, you generate fake y from real x, and then you have your adversary try to distinguish that, and vice versa for the other causal direction. And the authors did an ensemble approach on tuning again. The highest accuracy was 82%, though that's sort of an outlier. Maybe more accurate number is 70% to reflect their achievements. more sections to talk about, but I think I'll end it here for today. So thanks for coming.